And let me see if hopefully cross our fingers that our live stream is going to work this week. It didn't last week. So hopefully it will. All righty. Am I a co-host? You are a co-host. So you should be able to oh, share. I see it. Share screen. I see it. Yes. Thank you. All righty. So according to this, our custom live stream is working. So we should also be on Facebook Live. Very exciting. Um, all righty. Welcome, everybody. Um, this is our fourth um, Nature in Your Backyard um, Lunch and Learn. Um, I'm not going to go into the whole spiel about who we are today, um, but I do want to just let people know that um, we are, as we um, are doing, finishing up this one in the next couple of weeks, then we're going to have our bio blitz, which hopefully everyone will, um, will attend and, and be a part of. Um, starting at the end of October, we're going to start a new Lunch and Learn series. It's all about sustainability. So this one is going to be, um, we're going to do some renewable energy, um, there's going to be sustainable environments and habitats, um, so we're going to have some different speakers for that. So same basic idea, same time, Wednesdays at noon, um, but that'll be probably a, either a five, maybe six week. I'm trying to figure out all of my speakers right now, um, but that's going to be a, a great one that we'll um, pick up after this one ends. So we're really really excited about that. Um, and we're really excited um, for those of you who attended our very first one. Um, you will remember Laura. Laura Lutton is um, a fabulous volunteer with Bucks Audubon. She's also taking a sabbatical from her teaching um, this fall from Council Rock. So we're really, really excited to have her and her um, and her wonderful, amazing talents. And I love the fact that she was telling me before we got on that um, she goes, she was going out with her husband and like pointing out all the trees and really excited that she knew them. Um, and <laughs> she was a big giant nerd, and she said, "Well, of course she is." <laughs> so. So I was sad. That always makes me happy. I love a good fellow nerd. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Laura and um, we're going to learn all about um, woody plants today. So all right, Laura, take it away. All righty. So I want to share my screen. And in my screen, I have my PowerPoint. So can you all see? See it? I hope so. Are we? Not yet. You can't see it? No. Oops. Hmm. Okay. Let me just. Did you click the green button at the bottom? I, I, I think I did. So, oh, share. Aha. There Seeing it are. now. Yes. Excellent. So, so um, you'll remember this slide. This is Honey Hollow, and uh, this is our Nature in Our Backyard introduction. And we are on September 23rd, and I'm going to talk about trees and shrubs today. So good afternoon. And today during our Lunch and Learn, we're going to learn about trees and woody shrubs. And Trees and woody shrubs belong to the study of botany, and um, botany is the study of all plants. Trees and shrubs are just one small part of that study. So uh, when <clears throat> you're studying trees or you're trying to identify a tree, most of the time people will look at their leaf shape, and that's pretty much what we're going to do today. We're going to look at predominantly the leaf shape, but you can also talk about bark and the gesture of the tree. So I picked this tree here in this slide because it has this very interesting gesture. This looks like it might be um, a dead sycamore tree, but it, it looked to me like it was a monkey screaming. So I used it in this slide because it's fun. So scientists classify species according to other metrics as well. So they use a bunch of terminology that helps identify like the likelihood you'll see them, whether or not that they're um, naturally forming in the environment or they've been introduced to the environment, whether they spread easily or whether they pretty much stay put. So some of the terminology that um, biologists and, and a lot of scientists use when they talk about species in general would be um, Native and exotic, those are two main categories. So a native species um, is a species that's lived in the environment for thousands or hundreds of years. So, um, 
and it has found some sort of homeostasis with the other um, in, um, species in the environment with it. So if you're going to say a tree is native or a shrub is native to North America, it it should have been around before it was settled by Europeans. So like way, way back before the 1500s and so on. And But there's another qualifier for native. Sometimes people will say, um, it's native, it's native to the United States, but it's, it's really native to, let's say, Pennsylvania or New England. So um, if you take it from one area where it's native, like say New England, and you move it down into this California, then it might not, it could be considered exotic, which means that it shouldn't, it shouldn't be in that environment or it's new to that environment. So another terminology that's um, used quite a bit is the term exotic. So an exotic species is a plant that's been moved from one location into a new location. And um, so if you take a plant from Japan and you bring it to the United States, it's considered exotic. If you take a plant from the United States and go to Japan, it's exotic or anywhere where it's not natural to its distribution area. Now, the thing about exotics is that um, when you take it from its natural environment, it's removed from predators or parasites and diseases that typically keep them in balance. And what can happen with exotic species is that they become what's called invasive. And um, an invasive species will quickly spread in an in environment and almost take over the environment. And when it does that, it alters the composition or the structure, the ecology of the area, and it more often than not will kill off native species. It will um, overtake an area and then end up messing up the homeostasis of the environment, the ecology, and then um, species start to, native species start to disappear or die off, become extinct. So when a scientist introduce or anytime um, an, a plant becomes introduced, either on purpose or by accident, you run a risk without doing research that the species could become quickly invasive and then um, disrupt the ecology of the region. So how does something become quickly invasive? Well, there's two terms that scientists use to help understand whether or not that would happen. And the words are naturalized. So species that are um, exotic and naturalized tend to become invasive. So a naturalized species um, is a species that can spread its leaves, I mean, spread its seeds or even or easily distribute itself through an environment like a dandelion. So if you have a dandelion and um, it makes those little puffy seed ball, um, heads and the seeds go spreading out um, soon, if you, if you have a perfect lawn, let's say, let's hope you don't, but if you have a perfect lawn with no um, dandelions and your neighbor has tons of dandelions, it's really common that you would get a lot of dandelions because those seeds just distribute. And that's true for uh, trees and shrubs as well. Um, a real uh, case of a naturalized invasive species would be the Norway maple and tree of heaven that we have around here. And I'll have, I have them in my PowerPoint to show you what they look like and, and so on. Now, exotic species that are naturalized or even not naturalized tend to be super pretty. They are brought in because they are like pretty shade trees or they have beautiful leaves or really pretty flowers. And so they are looked at um, for their landscape qualities. And then they're not really looked at for what might happen once they escape a yard and then move into um, the environment outside of something that's being urbanized. So another type of um, terminology that scientists use is not naturalized. And a non-naturalized exotic species isn't really so much of a concern because it requires human propagation to, I mean, it requires human intervention to propagate. And a great example would be a lilac. 
And I like that in that uh, sometimes when I'm walking through the woods and I see a lilac bush, I think to myself, wow, this lilac bush, there's no reason for this lilac bush to be here. Somebody must have put it here. And what's really cool about this area, Bucks County and then Hunterdon County also across the river, is that there are lots of old houses and ruins and um, house foundations that are kind of covered over with trees and shrubs and whatever. And you don't necessarily know they're there. But if you, if you come across a lilac bush, I found that you find this lilac bush and you're like, ah, this might have been a lilac bush that was here a hundred years ago when somebody else lived here. And if you if you look around a little bit, sometimes you can find house foundations or um, stone walls or some other um, evidence that somebody had lived there a long time ago. Lilac bushes are super long lived. Another example of a not naturalized plant would be like a day lily because they don't move. I mean, they, they kind of get bigger in a certain area, but they don't go moving outside of, a, um, of an area that's very large. So those two, two plants are sometimes pretty, pretty good indicators that somebody has lived there a long time ago and um, no longer does. So not naturalized species, not so dangerous, not so earth shattering, but they're still considered exotic because they're brought in. So when you go out into the woods, or even if you're zooming around looking outside on a walk, uh, you're, you're really likely to see many native and exotic species as you wander around. And if you participate in the BioBlitz, you'll see both native and exotic species on Honey Hollow property as well. So, all right, so let's get back to identification. So because plants are primarily identified by leaf type, um, we're going to take a closer look at that. That's pretty much how I'm going to categorize these different trees. So botanists have looked at all kinds of leaves on all kinds of plants, and then they categorize them according to general leaf pattern. So um, common leaf categories could be alternate, which means there's a stalk, and on the stalk, on um, offset from each other are the leaves. They could be considered opposite, which means on the stalk they're directly opposite one another. You could have a simple leaf, which is just a single leaf on a stem. Compound is more than one leaflet together, just like a compound word would be like a basketball. You could have, it's, it's two, it's more than one leaf put together. Compound word is more than one word put together. Palmate is um, a leaf pattern that radiates out from single point like fingers on a palm. And so they tend to look like they're spreading out like that. And then pinnate are leaves that have like a, a central stem and then leaves coming out almost like a feather, feather-like pattern. So those are the basic terminologies uh, or um, terms that scientists use when they're describing leaf, leaf patterns. So the first category I'm going into is the pinnately compound leaves. And so here they would be considered opposite because they're directly across from each other. If these leaves were offset, they would be alternate. But these are compound leaves because there's more than one leaf on the stalk and um, they're opposite each other. So trees that have pinite, pinite leaves means that the leaflets are on the compound leaf. They grow alongside each other in a feather type of arrangement. Some common species are um, black walnut, Shag bark, hickory, and art and um, ash. So the black walnut is it's really easy to identify now. You know, it's a it's a really gorgeous native tree, and it tends to grow near streams and lakes, and it can grow up to 150 feet tall, and and definitely very wide. They have these very large branches, and uh, super straight trunk. It has um, both male and female flowers in the spring. And then in the autumn, they have these very large walnuts um, or nuts and they're edible. And um, uh, lots of like squirrels love the walnuts. There's um, all kinds of animals love to eat these. 
fruits or nuts from the walnut tree. Interesting about the walnut tree is it makes a great shade tree because it, the, the roots release um, a substance, it's called juglone, which kills plants that come in contact with the roots. So um, it doesn't have a whole lot growing up underneath it. So here you have this huge canopy of a beautiful tree and underneath it, it's just sort of dirt. Nothing else really likes to grow there. Now there's some things that will grow under a walnut tree, but for the most part, because of the um, substance that's produced by the roots, not much grows under there. So you can just have a picnic under a walnut tree and not have to worry about all kinds of plants and other um, things underneath it. So that's the walnut. It's a self-pollinator, so it doesn't need any help from bees or anything like that. And right now the leaves are gonna be turning yellow and dropping. Walnut trees lose their leaves really quickly, but what it's gonna do is hold on to the, its walnuts. And so when you look up, you'll see that the, the tree may be turning yellow, losing its leaves, but then you can see these nuts being held up in the branches. And they're starting to drop too. So um, gotta be careful underneath walnut trees this time of year, because you could easily slip on one of those. <laughs> those nuts. I've done that many times. So the second tree in this category is the shagbark hickory. This is a really distinctive trunk, right? So it has a trunk that, and it's a member of the walnut family, but it has a trunk that has these peeling plates that lift up. And um, what scientists are finding out is that bats like to hide inside those little curled up parts of the bark. And so I know I didn't know this until I started doing more research on the shagbark hickory, but now that I see it, I would think maybe I'll, you know, peek underneath there, you know, cause they would, bats would be sleeping up in there during the daytime. So that's pretty cool. Um, they, they grow to be about 80 feet tall, which is about maybe, um, when it's completely mature and uh, they produce something called hickory nuts, but only after they've been around for 40 years or more. So if you want hickory nuts in your yard and you're like, oh, I'm going to grow a shagbark hickory, you got to wait 40 years before it's going to even start to produce any nuts. And they live to be about 200 years old. They're related to the pecan tree, which is neato. And, um, yeah, that's about it that I have for the shagbark hickory. Very distinctive trunk. Oopsie. St distinctive trunk. Um, there, there's definitely a few of these up at Honey Hollow. All right. So the next one on this slide is called the ash. And we, we could just go with the white ash. And um, this is a sad story. So the ash has, you might be able to see the ash more commonly now if you're seeing a dead tree because the ash trees are being attacked by an insect called the emerald ash borer. And here's a picture of it right there. Um, pretty, pretty insect, it was introduced, it's an invasive insect from Japan. And what they do is they bore these holes in the ash tree and then um, they kill it. So the ash tree has this really corky looking bark, really pretty, and it has um, its nuts, are in these like, little wings and these, um, I, yeah, I guess you could call them wings. And the seed is right up at the top. And <clears throat> the wood is super strong and elastic. And so it's been used to make baseball bats and um, handles for tools and that sort of thing. So ash trees have been really important in, in the economy early on and also like for making cool things like baseball bats but um these are also important in in the environment because finches cardinals and groundhogs love the seeds the seed pods of these trees but when i was when i've been walking around more often than not i'm seeing ash trees that have been killed they they're just in a full canopy when everything has its leaves you'll see a tree with no leaves and if you look at the bark it's definitely an ash it's got that quirky look to it and you can find burrow holes in there and sometimes you can even see that um, emerald ash borer as well so that's a really sad story 
two more uh, trees that have this type of leaf pattern. One is the box elder. And when Stacy was talking about insects last, year, uh, last week, she was talking about the um, true insects that have that a diamond shape on their back. And the box elder beetle is a really pretty beetle. It's black and red, and it's one of those true insects. And it really loves the box elder tree. You'll see lots of those insects on the box elder. But um, a really cool thing about the box elder is it has a sugary sap just like a sugar maple. It just doesn't have that characteristic maple taste to it. So the box elder beetle really loves the sugary sap. And, um, and if I guess if you wanted to make a syrup, you could use the box elder if you if you wanted to. I don't think many people do though. Um, they, box elders are found on stream banks, um, and it's a member of the maple family. It's the only member of the maple family that has this style leaf, right? So most members of the maple family have like palmet leaves. They sort of they have um, lobed leaves that radiate out from a single point, but the box elder is a member of the maple family, the only member of the maple family that doesn't have that leaf type. And they have helicopter-like seeds, and these seeds spread very well. They fly around in the wind, and box elders, you can find these trees all over this area of Pennsylvania. So one other neat thing about a box elder is it has separate male and female trees. Neat. Okay. The last one in this category is the tree of heaven. So I have an affinity for the tree of heaven only because one of my favorite books was A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. And in the beginning of that book, the main character is sitting outside. She's sitting in her yard or in her house and this huge tree of heaven, she's looking into it and she's sort of just reminiscing about living in Brooklyn as a little girl. So that tree, um, A Tree Grows in Brooklyn is about you know, the, it's, the title comes from the tree of heaven. And it's, a, it's an exotic, and because it has these seeds that evenly like disperse easily, it's invasive. And um, it's really rapidly growing. It has the, the one really good identifier, if you're not sure if it's a tree of heaven or, or let's say an ash or even a walnut, one distinctive quality of the tree of heaven is it has these red stems down the center and the leaves on either side are green just like the others but that red stem and red branches are really indicative of the tree of heaven and um, it was brought to the United States in the 17 late 17 early 1800s as a fast-growing shade tree for urban development and um, it's taken over and, and it came in the uh, Pennsylvania area and now it's taken over a whole lot of the United States. So um, one thing, the animal, another invasive animal that is highly attracted to the tree of heaven is the spotted lanternfly. And I put these pictures here next to it too. Really, the spotted lanternfly, everybody loves to hate them. So when you see one, you smush it. They're super pretty, you know, just like all exotics, they tend to be really gorgeous. But what they do is they lay their eggs on the tree of heaven, and then when they hatch, they um, feed off other trees and cause a lot of damage to the ecosystem. So spotted, spotted lanternfly is moving um, into the area and is now super common. I saw one in my bird bath yesterday when I was outside in the garden. I was very sad about that. So um, anything else interesting about this tree? No, nope. just that it's an invasive, but it, it, it is a pretty tree. It can grow quite tall and um, if it's left alone and it will make a pretty shade tree. Okay, so the next category is um, the oaks, one of my favorite. So this oak in the background is a pin oak and I can tell you a really easy way to identify that. But um, oaks have what is called a lobed leaf. So it's a leaf that has um, little cutouts. Now those lobes can be either rounded like an earlobe or they can be pointed. Um, but so you have a lobe and a cleft and that's really characteristic of, of 
um, oak trees, but also maples. And so we'll do maples too, but first we're gonna do oaks. So um, some fun facts about oaks is that oaks have been around for 65 million years. So they were around right around the time the dinosaurs became extinct. So like I'm a geology nerd, so that's really cool. Um, there are over 600 species of oaks in the world, but uh, about 160 of them are native to North America. Uh, the oldest tree that's giving credit for living in the United States is the Pechanga Great Oak. And that's, it lives in California. It still produces acorns. And they're saying it's about 2,000 years old, right? So that's pretty darn old. Um, Druids worshipped oak trees and got married under them. Some other fun things, you know, oak is used for um, giving flavor to wine. Another fun thing about oak trees, they're used to make barrels. So um, there's three kinds of oak trees common in Southeastern, there's more than three, but I, you know, there's so many oak trees, I picked some of the three most common. So the white oak is the first one and they, they can live they can live to be about, they say between 200 to 1,000, but the Pechanga great oak is 2,000. So that's super special, you know, that's older. So the white oak is um, earlobed. So it's a lobed leaf, but they're rounded. And that's different from a, a lot of the other oaks. And uh, it, white oaks can become, they, they get really tall, but they also tend to be almost as wide as they are tall with these huge, large branches that move out in a horizontal way, these white oaks. And um, their bark tends to be light grayish. And um, let's see, they tend to be the tallest oak species in the United States. So there's that. They have a high tannin content. And in the old days, people used tannin to make leather softer and stronger. So they rubbed it in there and it was good for turning like leather into something more supple. So the white oak also, if you look at the underneath of the leaf, it tends to be lighter, like almost whitish. So, so that's another way, if you're looking at an oak, if it's got brown lobes and it's whitish underneath, the bark tends to be white, whitish grayish, then you're pretty sure it's a white oak. So the next oak is the red oak. And the red oak is the tree of New Jersey. Woot, I live in New Jersey, so that's pretty cool. The red oak has these gorgeous red leaves in the autumn and they tend to hold on to that red color for a really long time. And then once the color fades in the winter, the red oak doesn't drop its leaves. It tends to hold on to them and they turn brown and leathery looking. And then they don't fall until the spring when the new buds come out, they push the old leaf off. So um, the neat thing and big interesting difference between red oaks and white oaks, not just their leaf pattern, but their acorns. So red oak acorns take about two years to mature. And so they tend to be smaller than the white oak. And red oak um, acorns, they're edible, but they're super bitter. So you, people don't eat them, but they do, some people do eat white oak acorns. So they're not that bitter. And they, what I've heard is the reason the red oaks seem to be bitter is because they've got this sort of hairy quality underneath that um, casing. So I don't know how hairs make something bitter, but that's what they say. So the red oak, um, let's see. No, that's good. That's all about, that's all I have. Except the, the, the red oak tends to have a really dark bark whereas the white oak has like a grayish bark. So if this red oak tree, this looks like a juvenile, if it were really mature, it would have um, black, almost blackish bark look to it. So the third oak that I wanna talk about is the pin oak. And you can see that the leaf is similar. If you're looking at this leaf pattern, it's similar to the red oak in that it's pointy, but it's got a much deeper lobe in there. Like it, it's got a much more, it's more cut out. And 
So these leaves, it, it might not be, whoopsie, whoopsie daisy, it might not be super easy to tell the difference between a red oak leaf and a pin oak leaf. The pin oak leaves are smaller and they are much more deeply curved, but the pin oak tree is super easy to identify because unlike regular oaks, its horizontal branches tend to be rather thin and the bottom branches sort of weep down. They bend down, the medium, the middle branches sort of stick out and the top branches stick up almost in a vase-like shape. So it has this sort of and then the sort of droopy quality at the bottom. They, were, they um, do well in urban areas. They don't mind a whole lot of pollution. So typically if you're gonna see an oak tree on the side of the road, it's gonna be a pin oak because they don't really care if there's a lot of carbon monoxide or pollution in the area, they still thrive. So um, let's see, the largest pin oak is found in Louisiana and they have a, a shallow root system. So if you have a pin oak, it, it won't necessarily interfere with the sidewalk or um, the road, which is another good reason pin oaks are um, urban oaks found on sidewalks and that sort of thing. So and a, um, some neat uh, facts about oaks is that they can make 10 million acorns over the course of their life. And of those 10 million acorns, only one in 10,000 becomes an oak tree because so many animals love to eat the acorns, squirrels, you name it, fox, everything. So um, one final thing is if you're a truffle fan, if you like truffles, you can't grow truffles just like plant truffles. So truffles are pretty elusive and they're found under oak trees. So it turns out that if people want to get truffles or have a truffle farm, what they do is they plant a lot of oaks and then the truffles come for some reason. And it's pretty, pretty neat. So those are the, the three oaks in this. The next category is the maples. And they are considered palmately lobed because they have that central radiating point in which the, um, the leaf moves out. Uh, maples have these winged fruits and seeds. And on this slide, there's two maples. There's the, an exotic invasive maple, which is the Norway maple, and then a native maple, which is the sugar maple. So if you wanna know the difference between whether you're looking at a sugar maple or a Norway maple, their leaves look a lot the same, but they're, their um, seeds look a lot different. So the Norway maple was introduced from Northern England um, in the 1700s. And the bark has these dark fissures in it. Whereas the sugar maple tends to be more platy in its bark and lighter. And um, the leaves turn, if, or the Norway maple, they turn yellowish green in the autumn, whereas the sugar maple turns these beautiful red colors, reddish orange colors. But um, so in the autumn, if you see a red leaf, it's probably a sugar maple and not a Norway maple. The difference, the main difference is their seed pod. So the seed pod of the sugar maple, that it sort of sticks up like this, whereas the Norway maple, the wings are on the side or horizontally. So the sugar maple is the maple that makes maple syrup. And the thing about maple syrup is it's not easy to make. It takes 40 gallons of sugar maple sap to make one gallon of maple syrup, which is a lot. So it's only, it turns out that if you were to cut a sugar maple and taste the sap, it wouldn't taste sweet. I've done that myself. It's just like, uh, this is, you know, sort of boring, um, but they sort of boil it down and intensify the sugar. And um, so sap is 2%. It's considered, the sugar maple is considered a keystone species, which is an important species because of its ecological significance and supporting other trees like beech, white ash, and red oak. So sugar maples, we love sugar maples. And the problem with the Norway maple is that it's pushing out the sugar maple, it's taking over the um, native habitat of sugar maples because it grows quicker and it's weedier. Okay, so a look alike to a maple 
is a sweet gum tree. So you can see it has that same kind of leaf, really pretty. But it has these little seed pods here that you can see. And um, so the sweet gum tree has star-shaped leaves. They turn bright red in the fall. It's got uh, a super straight trunk. And the oldest is about 795 years old. And that one's found in Missouri. That's the oldest one. But I think actually that tree died. And then they, they did a, a sample. They bored into the tree. And they're like, oh, they counted the rings. And it was 795 years old. So um, the sweet gum tree, if you were to crush the leaves, it has this sort of resinous smell to it. So some people think a sweet gum tree is a maple, but it's not. It just looks like a maple. So moving on, there's some trees of note, like some of these, these are the giant trees in the area. So three trees that are really spectacular trees to look at and to walk underneath are the tulip poplar, the sycamore, and the London plane. The sycamore and the London plane look a lot alike because the London plane tree is hybridized between the sycamore and the plane tree. So, but let's start with the tulip poplar, which is, it's a stunning tree because it's, super tall um, and uh, you can look at a, the tree trunk and it can go up almost 50 feet before there's even a branch. So they look like they just are thrust out of the ground. They're really round and super tall and rather large. So, um, they have this kind of leaf. Now it's called simple and alternate. So it's not a palmate leaf, but um, it kind of has that quality. Uh, it has these, le um, these flowers in the spring. This is why it's called a tulip poplar because it, its flowers look just like a tulip, but they're way up in the canopy. And um, most of the time you'll see them when they drop off in, in the late spring after the tree has bloomed. Um, tulip poplar trees don't live to be super old if you think 250 years isn't very old. They live to be about 250 years old. And once in the autumn, and you might be able to see this if now, is their fruit that come from the, from the uh, flowers. They tend to be like green, about two or three inches long, and they're kind of scaly. They look like um, a miniature banana, but with scales. And then if you sort of crush it, it has a real pungent smell to it. And then as it matures, it turns into um, seeds. So that's one thing about the tulip poplar. Um, yeah, I guess they don't look like bananas. So they kind of look more like okra. But this, the um, next tree on this slide is the sycamore. And the sycamore is the most stunning in the wintertime when it's lost its leaves because the tips of the bark, especially in the upper canopy of the tree, are almost pure white. And it looks like bones almost. It's, and these are huge trees that have a, they take up a huge area of the canopy. And when you're looking at them, and definitely in the winter, you have these beautiful high pressure skies where there's not a lot of clouds and it's a beautiful blue sky. When you have a sycamore against that, it's just some of the most beautiful trees. But during the summer, if you're like, I wonder what kind of tree this is, tulip, I mean, our sycamore trees have this um, sort of camouflage type of look to the tree. So they have two layers of bark. The outer bark tends to be brown and it peels away. And underneath is this white sort of greenish bark underneath. And um, they can get to be like 125 feet or taller and they live to be about 600 years old. So almost three and a half times longer than the tulip poplar. Um, when they flower, they are pollinated by bees. So that's kind of fun to have like bees up in that canopy. And um, they are the largest deciduous trees in the Eastern United States. They are super neat, super large. And they turn orangish in the autumn, but they also, those leaves, if it's dry autumn, like this autumn, they tend to also skip the pretty orange part and go straight to just turning brown and falling off, which 
which is a bummer. So um, the next tree is the London Plain. And it's almost shocking how similar the two trees look. If you look at the bark of the London Plain and the leaf of the London Plain, it's very similar. And like I said, it's because it's part um, sycamore and then part plane tree. The, the interesting difference, and I don't know if this is a great way to describe it, but it seems like the trunk looks like, if you're looking at it, you're not sure, hey, this is a sycamore, it kind of looks white, it has a more greenish quality. It looks like the bottom of the trunk is melting a little bit, almost. It has these sort of lobes and it's sort of like a candle that is sort of slumping down. Whereas um, the sycamore tends to be much more graceful and erect in its trunk gesture. So um, the London plane tree is still a beautiful tree, but it's sort of like, not as elegant as um, the sycamore. This, these London plane trees were used a lot in urban development. In old um, boulevards, you can see London plane trees on either side of the street, and they make this beautiful canopy over the street, but they tend to, like they shed their bark and they can be a little bit what's considered messy, I, you know, if that's a big deal. But um, they make seed pods just like the sycamore, but they have dual seed pods like this, whereas the sycamore just has like a single seed pod. So that's the London plane tree, another gorgeous tree. So these three trees are like some of like the most stunning trees in the canopy in, in northeastern Pennsylvania. So on, on to the mulberry family. You know, so the mulberry family, these are much smaller trees. Uh, the two mulberries that are super common around here are the red and white mulberry. The red mulberry is native and the white mulberry is exotic. They both make mulberry um, berries, <laughs> which are super yummy and sweet. The white mulberry has white fruit. The red mulberry has red fruit. And they have different kinds of leaves. So they have three general leaf patterns. They have this mitten kind of look to it. And you can see in the picture, they have like a complete leaf and then they have a deeply lobed leaf. So um, the, the white mulberry was brought to the United States in the 1800s because from by the silk industry, because it turns out silk moths, when they make their cocoons out of silk, um, that silk is really great for making clothes. But when they brought the mulberry tree over here for the silk industry, the, the silkworms didn't like the climate, whereas the trees did. So the silkworms weren't, it didn't do what they were hoping. So the silkworms didn't make it, the mulberry trees did, and then they sort of invaded into, um, into the ecology and the, in the area. So mulberries, uh, Turtles love mulberry trees, which I love turtles. I, I talked about um, amphibians and reptiles a couple of weeks ago. And um, even so, that's one reason why not to hate the white mulberry, because if you're under a white mulberry tree or even a red mulberry tree, it's likely you're gonna see turtles like chowing down on those yummy fruits. So um, the mulberry tree leaf is, it's complete but it has um, sort of serrated edges and they tend to be a little bit wavy. So the interest, another thing that's neat about mulberry family is that they have a lot of pollen, like so much so that there are certain cities that have outlawed planting mulberry trees any longer because people who have allergies have such a bad reaction to the pollen of the mulberry that it's been banned in Tucson, Las Vegas, and El Paso. Oh, those are the state or the cities that I know of, but I'm I'm pretty sure that there's some other places that it's been outlawed since then because it's a, it's got such heavy pollen. Okay, um, another member of the mulberry family is the Osage orange tree. This tree is super cool. It's one of my favorites. It has these huge fruits, and you can see in the picture, it's like the fruit will fit in your hand, and um, the trees can be either male or female. And uh, they live for over 400 years. So um, there's both exotic and native Osage oranges. If you see an Osage orange today, it's likely exotic. But um, botanists and geologists believe that the original native Osage oranges were food for megafauna, 
like back a uh, hundred thousand years ago, right after the, I mean, I'm sorry, 10,000 years ago after the last major ice age, that they think that giant ground sloths and North American camels fed off the fruit. And then um, when they went to the bathroom, distributed the seeds around. Now, this fruit today, there's no animal that completely ingests it. So um, the native Osage orange, there's very few of those. Uh, um, it's the introduced from China Osage orange that is now rapidly moving into the area. And they, I think it, it's like their fruit is more easily digestible by animals in the area. So these trees are, uh, they're, they're super tall, they're super thick, and they're really thorny. So if you look in the lower left hand corner of the PowerPoint, you can see that they have these sharp uh, thorns. And so they were used uh, in the 16, 17, 1800s as fences because they were too tall for horses to get out. They're too thick for, for um, pigs to get through. And they're really strong trees. And so um, they're the densest tree in the world. And if you burn an Osage orange tree, it makes the hottest temperature. So I guess that has to do with the density of the tree too. So um, Native Americans use this bark to make bows because it tends to be pretty, pretty bendable. So that's the last member of the mulberry family. So I'm <laughs> running out of time. Here's the sassafras, one of my favorites. So it's a lobed um, tree also. And just like the mulberry, the leaves can be three different types of shapes, a mitten shape, a complete shape or a deeply lobe shape. And with the sassafras, um, it's, if you take that leaf off and you smush it, it's really aromatic. Um, the sassafras, oopsies, that's the ginkgo. The sassafras doesn't typically move by seeds. It moves by um, root suckers. So the roots will go underground and then pop up a new tree a little bit far, farther away. The leaves tend to be pretty dark green on top and lighter underneath, and they turn orangish red in the autumn. The leaves themselves are used for um, medicines, tea, and perfume. If you've smelled the sassafras, super distinctive. And I think there's also a soda, like sassafras soda, that was common a while back. I, I haven't seen any around lately. All right, next tree is the ginkgo. And this is considered a living fossil because uh, it's been around for over a hundred million years, pretty much exactly as it looks today. And the ginkgo um, is the only species, this is the only species left in the ginkgo family. So you're only looking at one type of tree. It has um, these rounded greenish fleshy fruits that drop and sometimes make a mess. Some people don't really like the ginkgo tree because if you have the female tree, it will definitely drop a lot of fruit down. Um, it has a really tall distinctive uh, trunk and then the branches kind of spiral out. And in some branches, in some old ginkgo trees, the branches can even fuse back together. It's a very interesting looking tree and it turns a gorgeous ye lemon yellow color in the autumn. So they're tolerant of pollution and so you might see these trees planted in urban areas because just like the pin oak, carbon monoxide, pollution, it doesn't really bother them. They grow really well. So um, living fossils. I love to think that dinosaurs were zooming around when uh, like around ginkgo trees. And they're super pretty. They have that fan-shaped leaf. Just a few to go. So the catalpa tree is the next tree. It's an invasive species. It's exotic and it, it can be confused with um, the chestnut tree. Chestnut tree has similar flowers but um, the chestnut tree has a very different leaf pattern than the catalpa. The catalpa has heart-shaped leaves and these orchid-looking flowers, and flowers come out right around May Day, like um, May 5th. And so um, the flowers turn into these long seed pods, 
and the seed pods will stay on the tree and slowly turn brown. And inside the seed pods are these tiny little seeds. And during the first really heavy frost, the tree will drop both its pods and its leaves at, at once. So it becomes, it's like this mass exodus of, of leaves and pods from the catalpa. They grow about 80 feet tall and they tend to grow in stands. So you can see um, if there's one catalpa tree, there's probably five and they hang out together. And when they bloom, they are really pretty and very sweet smelling. So you, you might even smell it before you see it if you're walking in the woods. And then you'll probably see quite a few. So these seed pods look like gigantic green beans. And then they, they're also called cigar trees because they turn brown and then I guess they look like really long cigars once. Not that I, I you know, I don't see it, but um, there's that. So that's the Catalpa. Then there's the American beech super, super common. And one of the most gorgeous kinds of trees because it has this very um, smooth bark that scars easily. So people just love to carve their initials into these gorgeous poor trees. And um, so uh, they tend to also have this characteristic scarring on them that looks like eyes. And so I put this uh, picture in here because this tree looks like it's pretty upset. And when I took that picture, there's a whole lot of carving on the bottom part of the tree. So I would assume that that's probably why that tree is so disappointed. But um, the beech tree has complete leaves that there's lightly serrated around the edges and they tend to be in groups of three. The leaves, um, they like dry, a dry soil and they tend to be found where there's a lot of limestone. So in um, a little bit farther west, there tends to be a lot of caves, uh, limestone caves, Kutztown area, and you can see a lot of beech trees in and around the caves. So um, they make a beech nut, and there's a picture of the beech nut here in the middle on the bottom, and those, those nuts, they like uh, the shell pops open like four different um, little doors. They pop open and out comes the beech nut and those beech nuts are edible and they're they're really important to little mammals in and around the forest floor. So here's another beech tree that's been heavily carved. It kind of looks like a person's profile. So. Um, the dogwood <laughs> the dogwood, everybody knows the dogwood. The dogwood is loved by um, a lot of different birds because of their seeds. Dogwoods tend to be understory uh, trees. They tend to be small. They don't like a lot of sunlight. So if you want to plant a dogwood on your property, it's probably best to plant it where there's dappled sunlight. Um, they also, dogwoods tend to have like, if you look in the lower right hand corner, they have lichens that grow on them. So even healthy trees, if they have this lichen pattern or lichens growing on them, it doesn't mean that the tree's dying. It just, they just, lichens like dogwood trees. So there's three conifers that are in the PowerPoint. Conifers grow, in harsher climates than deciduous trees. So deciduous trees, they lose their leaves in the winter because they lose too much water through their leaves and they don't get enough sunlight to create enough chlorophyll to keep the leaves. Uh, conifers have fixed that problem by just having these little needles. And um, you tend to find them in colder areas, drier areas, and then higher altitudes where it's, it's colder and drier. <laughs> so, Conifers that you'll see in the area are the white pine. So white pines are considered the tallest trees in, in the United States. So they say that an unconfirmed um, white pine was 230 feet tall. And how do you know if it's a white pine? Well, they have these bundles of these long, thin needles and they come in bundles of five and the word white has five letters in it and there's five little needles and so you just pop off one of those bundles and you go w-h-i-t-e and you're like oh it's a white pine i'm 
I'm so clever. Um, they have very long straight trunks and they have um, cones that are tend to be rather large. So the, the next pine is the hemlock and the hemlock is, it's a really gorgeous tree and it has some of the smallest pine cones in the conifer family. It tends to be really um, cone shaped and in the spring you can see that it has these really pretty little light green tips. One thing that's a real problem with the hemlock, which is by the way the Pennsylvania state tree, is that there is an invasive aphid that um, is killing hemlocks all over and it's called the woolly adeldridge, adeldred, and um, adeldred. And it's, it's, they tend to be like white, like fluffy little um, aphids that sort of swing their butts back and forth. It's, it's the most peculiar looking aphid. And you'll find them along the stem in particular of the hemlock. And when you see that, that woolly aphid on the stem of the, of the hemlock, that's bad news for the hemlock because um, it's likely going to to die from from that. So of course the woolly adelgid is invasive. It came from Asia. The hemlock is is powerless to protect itself from this this insect, and so it doesn't have a natural defense against it. Um, it's in the old days the hemlock was used for making log cabins. So if you if you see some of these old log cabins, you might say, eh, that's a hemlock branch or hemlock uh, trunk. So the final one is the red cedar, the eastern red cedar. They can grow 90 feet tall. And this cedar, the bark is really distinctive. It's super red. And the bark peels off in these sheets, these long sheets. Uh, the red cedar is a member of the juniper family, and junipers tend to have these like uh, little green fruits. Um, the city of Baton Rouge is named after the red cedar. So Baton Rouge means red stick in French. And so when um, people were in the Mississippi River moving along that area, they saw these beautiful red cedars, and they're like, oh, look at those. <laughs> in French, red stick, uh, these red cedars. And so they named that uh, city Baton Rouge. Uh, they're super fragrant and disease resistant and rot resistant. So they're used for fence posts. People make uh, chests out of them. They make dressers out of them because their insects don't really, they really don't like the cedar. So it, it ends up being like five minutes of one. And um, we're, we're really out of time. So I only had three shrubs. Two of them are invasive and one of them is native. The most fun one is the spice bush. The spice bush smells really great. It's, it's more aromatic than even the sassafras. They tend to be super small, maybe 15 feet if they're super big, but they tend to be about five feet tall. And this picture in the upper right hand corner is a really good example of of, of what it looks like in the understory. It's innocuous. It has complete leaves that tend to be a little bit ruffly. And there's the spice bush swallowtail. This butterfly um, loves the spice bush. So it eats the leaves. And in the spring, it, um, it makes, it lays its little eggs. And you can find um, the caterpillars on these in the spring and in the summer. So I guess the next thing would be are there any questions <laughs> and anything about the bio blitz? I don't I've taken a lot of time. So Stacy, what do you say? Um, I don't see any questions in the chat, but um, but if people okay. have them, feel free to type them in quick. I'm just going to do a real quick um, push for the BioBlitz. Um, this whole series is really about introducing people to some of what you would find in your backyard and also what we would have at Honey Hollow so that people will hopefully feel comfortable coming out um, at some point between October 18th and 24th um, to participate in our, in our BioBlitz. Um, and for the BioBlitz, we're using the iNaturalist app, um, which is a really, really great app. So even if you aren't going to do the BioBlitz, um, 
I would definitely recommend um, downloading the iNaturalist app um, and giving it a whirl. It's great fun. Um, it's I tend to use it as my, you know, I don't know what this is exactly. So I'll take a picture of it and see if iNaturalist can tell me. And sometimes it can and sometimes it can't, but um, but it, but it's but it's fun to sort of um, figure it out. Um, if you've attended some of these before, you know that um, there's so many different things that we could go over um, and so many details. Um, I know I learned a ton today um, from Laura. So great presentation, Laura. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, thank you all so much for coming. Um, next week, oh, I forgot. I think next week is mammals. It is. Uh, I think that'll be tons of fun as well. And um, this uh, presentation, if you want to watch it again, will go up on um, our YouTube channel, which you can get to from our website. Um, probably in the next day or so. Um, so I think those are all the main things. Um, thank you all again so much for coming and um, hopefully, um, hopefully we'll see everyone next week. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, have a good day.